Well, it's hard to follow that introduction, but I'll try. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Mike Wazalewski for the uh, Photos Mosaic Antenna Research Center uh, seminar today. Um, Mike is a professor of chemistry at Northwestern University. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science in 1971 and his PhD in 1975, both at the University of Chicago. Um, following his graduate work, he did a postdoctoral fel fellowship um, period at uh, Columbia University and then moved to Argonne National Lab. Uh, he rose through the ranks there and uh, became senior science and group leader of the molecular photonics group. And in 1994, he moved to Northwestern University. Um, where he is currently the Claire Hamilton Hall Professor of Chemistry. Um, he served as the chair of the chemistry department there from 2001 to 2004. Um, he is also the director of the Oregon Northwestern Solar Energy Research Center, ANSWER, one of the 46 DOE EFRCs, analogous to Park here at WashU. Um, and he holds also a position as a senior scientist at the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Oregon. Uh, Mike's work um, is very broad in its scope and has covered light-driven charge transfer processes in molecules, materials, and photosynthesis on the nanoscale and larger. Um, his work has resulted in 360 publications, so he's been very productive. Um, he also has a number of distinctions. He's the, uh, um, was elected a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science in 1995. Um, he's been uh, uh, many distinguished lectureships. Uh, just recently, he uh, uh, was uh, awarded the 2012 Arthur C. Scope Scholar Award of the ACS for his fundamental work on organic supermolecular structures and dynamics of energy and electron transfer. Um, he's received a number of, other, a number of other awards, including the Porter Medal, James Norris Slack Award of Physical Organic Chemistry, and the Photochemistry Research Award of the Inter-American Photochemical Society. So Mike's going to hear us here today to talk to us about his research uh, in integrating Photoconversion with catalysis. I know there's some light harvesting in here someplace. Uh, and so uh, I don't know why it's gone from the title now, but I know it's there and we're going to hear about it today. Mike, uh, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thanks, Julie. That was a generous introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. This is actually my first visit uh, officially to Washington University. And um, what I'm going to try to do this morning is uh, a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to start off by um, telling you a little bit about uh, the Answer Center, because since this is a park uh, symposium or, or seminar, uh, I think it's always nice to find out what the other guys are doing a little bit. Um, I'm also going to focus on one aspect of our research with, that is uh, largely within the center, and that is how to couple light-driven charge capture and transduction and, um, to um, catalysis, which is a major problem that we're all facing with regard to solar fuels. So I'm going to focus largely on the solar fuels aspect of what we do. So it almost goes without saying with this audience, I almost don't have to, to produce this slide, but just to sort of set the stage, we all know that uh, we have a problem with regard to energy needs over the next century. And this need is really coming uh, largely from the fact that uh, over the next uh, 50 or 100 years, the, what we now call the developing world is going to come close to achieving a, a, a global standard of living, as it were. And in order to do that, we will need to provide uh, uh, almost triple the energy that we consume now by the year 2100. And so where is this energy going to come from? Well. There are many potential sources that the energy could come from, but of course the main issue that we all face is um, uh, how much of the planet's resources and how much of the planet's environment do we need to uh, destroy in order to provide this energy need. And so in, indeed, in order to uh, mitigate the potential uh, destruction of our environment, uh, we need to turn to what nominally is the largest energy source out there, and that is the sun. And we all know that um, the, this, the 
statistic is impressive in the sense that we get about 10,000 times more energy from the sun at every moment than we're actually using on Earth currently. And so even if we're completely parochial about our, our um, view, we can say that we have more than 100 times what we need impinging on the US alone. And so we have to do something about it. We have to be efficient, but we don't have to be super efficient. In other words, we don't have to cover everything with solar panels in order to do this. We just need to be have a mix of strategies, a mix of technologies, which will move us forward into having renewable solar energy be part of the energy landscape in the US and globally. So uh, how are we going to do this? Well, there are a variety of ways we can do this. Uh, we can develop uh, uh, solar-based fuels, uh, for, because fuels, liquid fuels especially, are critical for transportation. Uh, we're never going to have electric airplanes. And so uh, we're going to need uh, liquid fuels of some sort to fuel uh, large uh, ships and so forth as well. Uh, we're going to need new ways to uh, store energy. We're going to need new ways to uh, convert uh, solar energy into any kind of stored, uh, stored uh, product so that we can actually store the energy in chemical bonds, for instance. So there are a variety of ways to do this, and the Answer Center is set out to do uh, this, this kind of task as are a number of the EFRCs in the solar-related area. Right now, the Answer Center consists of five organizations. Uh, the lead organization is Northwestern with 13 PIs. We have seven PIs at Argonne, one apiece at the University of Chicago and the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, and uh, three PIs at Yale University. So these 25 uh, individuals are, are teamed together and with a vision that is uh, lofty, but I think achievable, basically, we want to re revolutionize our understanding of molecules, materials, and methods to really provide the foundation to create these new technologies. And so it's really a fundamental science operation, but a science operation that is, has, a, has a mission, a, a target, if you will, of uh, solar fuels and electricity both. Um, the focus really is on, as I mentioned, cutting edge molecules and materials, but also on interfaces, nanostructured assemblies, theory, time resolved spectroscopy, and also x ray structural probes uh, that can provide these insights into structure and function and how dynamics and mechanism are inter interweaved. The one word that comes out of this in terms of our center is mechanism. We are interested in how things work, uh, both on a time and spatially re resolved uh, uh, playing field. So this is really the, the core of what we do, and you'll see that through the, the remarks that I'm going to make about my, my own research. The organization of the center is fairly simple. We have three subtasks, and subtask one is, in fact, the solar fuel subtask. Uh, the leadership uh, of the subtask are Dave Teedy at Argonne and Mark Ratner at, at Northwestern, and it contains the Yale group, uh, Victor Batista, Gary Brudvig, Bob Crabtree, Tom Rauquist uh, at Illinois, um, Sam Stoop and myself at, at Northwestern. Uh, the second subtask is focused on organic photovoltaics with a special emphasis on interfaces. And that is, we know that these devices are interfacial in nature. In other words, there are many layers that, uh, that one has to transmit charge across or not transmit charge across, depending on, on the conditions. And so uh, Tobin Marks uh, from Northwestern and Lynn Chen from Northwestern are, are, and Argonne are, are working in this area. Uh, with, along with Bob Chang, Mark Freeman, Mark Herson, Tom Mason, Ken Popelmeyer from Northwestern, Oleg Kolektov from Argonne, and Lu Ping Yu from Chicago. And last but not least, the third subtask is, is developing nanostructured architectures uh, using a variety of techniques. Uh, one in particular that uh, we've become very fond of is atomic layer deposition, which allows us literally to produce uh, conformal um, uh, hard materials uh, essentially one atomic layer at a time, and to use this, these strategies to produce uh, electrodes and materials for a variety of solar cell applications, including uh, disensitized solar cells. And Joe Hupp and Mercury Conitzidis at uh, Northwestern are heading this up, along with uh, Mike Pellin, Jeff Elam, Alex Martinson at Argonne, uh, Gary Wiedert at Argonne, uh, George Schatz at Northwestern, and Terry Odom at Northwestern as well. So this is really the, the sweep of what's going on. And so, indeed, we have activities both in the, in the fuels area and in the uh, electricity area. 
Now, of course, as we all know, these are, these are highly, <coughs> highly, relate, highly related activities because the same issues of energy migration, charge separation, and doing something with the charges actually transcends the entire suite of activities. And so let me now just move right along into our own activities, which you know, essentially historically have followed the, the, the idea that nature has taught us a lot about energy transduction. And energy transduction and photosynthesis is really the source of all stored carbon on the planet. And so indeed, um, has been around a long time. And we have a lot of lessons that we can take away from, from the tremendous understanding of photosynthesis that's been uh, developed over the last uh, uh, 40 or 50 years. In fact, going from essentially a black box to molecular structural detail has, has really been the, the amazing development over uh, the lifetime of many of us. And so it's really been an exciting area to be involved with over these years. And so what can we do with this? Well, what, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what have we learned from photosynthesis? Well, here are some uh, beautiful structures that have, that have come out of the uh, X-ray crystallography of the various isolated proteins that actually do photosynthesis. The bacterial systems with the light harvesting ring-shaped uh, uh, protein complexes that then transfer energy into a reaction center. The reaction center itself, which was the first uh, such structure uh, crystallized and resolved, and which uh, in a series of, of rapid steps uh, upon light at absorption uh, translocates an electron across the membrane. And to the, the more recently, the, light, the uh, green plant uh, proteins, especially photosystem II, which has this marvelous water splitting um, uh, tetramanganese cluster within it, which we would all like to emulate in some way to split water and ultimately produce hydrogen uh, using a photodriven process. So what have we learned? Well, what we've learned is what your center is part of. In other words, we've learned that large arrays of light harvesting chromophores can be used to funnel the exotons into reaction centers where the actual photochemistry occurs. In other words, we use the light to separate charge. The reaction centers all use multi-step charge separation. In other words, um, it's photo-initiated, but the secondary steps are thermally, thermally downhill. So what we end up with is producing redox equivalents with sufficient lifetime to drive uh, much slower chemical reactions. These chemical reactions are generally multi-electron pro proton coupled redox processes. In other words, pulling out multiple electrons from the tetramanganese cluster. Or for instance, in the case of uh, proton reduction, uh, we might want to couple this to the two electron reduction of protons to hydrogen. So biological processes use these multi-electron uh, uh, redox leveling through proton coupled processes in order to do real catalysis. And last but certainly not least in this context is the fact that we all know that biology self-assembles things exquisitely. And so this not only gives us a, a potential of using building block approaches to developing new systems, but also, uh, as we all know, biology has a marvelous uh, self-repair mechanisms, uh, usually through some sort of disassembly assembly protocol. And so it would be really nice ultimately to emulate some of this as well. So this is what we learned, and so what are we going to do about it, basically? So first of all, let's talk about the, the process that we'd all like to do. We'd all like to emulate this, this uh, million molec plus molecular weight complex and ultimately couple the, the protons that result from water splitting to generate hydrogen. So as usual is, usually is the case, we always uh, divide this, this chemistry into two half reactions, splitting water to give oxygen protons and then reducing the protons to, to form uh, hydrogen gas. And so we need separate catalysts for each, each system. And so I'm going to show you today a, a, a group of, of photo-driven uh, systems which mate catalysts with uh, light harvesting slash photoconversion molecules. In other words, molecules that actually separate charge. And I'm going to address specific issues with each one of these. Like, for instance, one of the main issues that one runs into is that if you have a photoexcited state, in other words, a molecule that is in, a, in an excited single state, for instance, if you have that molecule very close to a, uh, a metal catalyst, uh, what you find is that frequently the ex that excited state is quenched by the presence of the, the complex and doesn't result in it, which that quenching doesn't really result in a, in a productive redox processes. So, other things are happening that are competing for the energy. So what are the things that can happen? Like, for instance, 
You can have rapid energy transfer to low-lying DD states of the metal. These, these states are naturally there and, in, in point of fact, can be really problematic. So we're going to take a look at some of, some of those issues. Uh, you can actually quench the excited state if the, your metal has a paramagnetic, is a paramagnetic center. In other words, if it has an odd number of electrons, then the paramagnetism can result in an excited state quenching process. Uh, and last but not, not, but not least as well, the um, enhanced spin orbit intersystem crossing through unquenched uh, angular momentum is also a problem. The classical heavy atom effect that photochemists will typically talk about. And so clearly, with metals, we're always dealing with heavy atoms. And so this, is, this can be an important issue. So let's talk first about the, the easier of the two problems, if you will, that is reducing protons to hydrogen. So we have a, na a nature, a natural uh, uh, example of this that's really very effective. In other words, hydrogenases. Hydrogenases are not photosynthetic by and large, and so consequently, uh, the, the advantages they use, the, for instance, the iron-only hydrogenases use earth-abundant materials, in other words, iron, and they turn over or they equilibrate hydrogen with protons at the thermodynamic pot potential at ambient conditions with high turnover frequencies. And they have this unusual cofactor, this dithiolate diiron cofactor with unusual cy cyano and carbonyl ligands, which uh, has produced a whole industry of, of molecular mimics uh, over the last several years because there are some advantages. In other words, the advantages, these mimics are very easy to prepare. You can do this from inexpensive starting materials. And you can tune their properties using changes in the ligand structure or changes into the, uh, the groups that are part of the dithiolate as well. And so it's resulted in a really a nice, a nice body of work. However, there, there are some negatives as well. And the negatives largely are First of all, when you pull this cofactor out of the protein, it becomes much, much harder to reduce. And so, and spectacularly so, 600, 600, 700 millivolts. And so, in fact, what, became, what was a good catalyst and easy to uh, produce or to, to drive with reducing equivalents from another source, all of a sudden becomes a tough case. Uh, similarly, these, lig these carbonyl ligands are very labile and actually have a tendency to fall off. And so, one needs to find other, other uh, strategies in order to, to help out. So where we came into this uh, game was to take a look at some what was in the literature. And one thing we noticed a couple of years ago was the fact that from Don Tooley's group, they played a classical uh, uh, physical organic game on, the, on this particular uh, system. In other words, they used a naphthalene derivative, in which as they made the naphthalene more electron deficient, they were able to push the redox potential of the, the diiron complex a little more positive. And so this, this sort of uh, 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 was noted by us in the fact that this, this naphthalene structure was related to lots of things we've done over the last 20 years. And indeed, what we discovered was the fact that we could actually take a naphthalene uh, dianhydride, which was a dithiane, and that particular system is a very electron deficient, and it turns out it exists in the literature. And in a one-step reaction using iron carbonyl uh, complex, we were able to generate this diiron complex on this particular ligand. And indeed, you could even uh, uh, condense on an amine, giving us a natural place to hook things on, and then go and make the complex directly. So if we take a careful look at this new dithiolate complex, we found that, interestingly, here's its, here's its x-ray crystal structure. I mean, it's exactly what we expect. In other words, uh, there were no, no, no mysteries there. It was the structure we hoped we'd get. But the important thing is that the redox potentials are only about 30, or excuse me, about 80 millivolts more negative than the natural catalyst. And so we push the redox back into a regime where we might be able to actually do something with it. That having been said, it, it's not a half bad electrocatalyst. In other words, if we put this uh, catalyst, this particular molecule itself, in, in the presence of strong acid, we find that at the second reduction wave, we can actually catalytically reduce. So the question is, how do we know where the electron's going in this particular complex? Well, as luck would have it, because
because these reductions are reversible, we can easily do spectral electrochemistry and look for spectral changes in the visible region of the spectrum. And what we found at about 615 nanometers was a nice absorption band due to reduction of the complex. And so we can use this band to try to understand where the electron is and where, where it's going in a photo-driven system. But once again, we have to be cautious in the sense that, well, are we going to end up with a system that some other side chemistry is, is, is occurring? Well, before we do that, let's take a look at the structure. Basically, do we get what we expect when we reduce the complex? Because we have a nice, stable, re reductive state, in other words, mono-reduced state, uh, we can do XAFs, and this was done in collaboration with Lin Chen and her group. Uh, the, if you look at the iron, uh, carbon, iron carbon distances and the iron iron distances in the resting state of the complex versus the uh, mono-reduced state, you get pretty much what you expect. You get fairly long bond, uh, significant bond changes. I don't want to believe the dye-reduced state because the, the rate of decomposition of the dye-reduced state is much higher, and over the time it takes to do the XAFs, uh, it's probably on, well on the way to being decomposed. But I think the, the result on the monoduce is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good in the sense that you can actually cycle it back and forth and it, and it works out fine. But it, it does, in fact, suggest that where the electron is going is really at the iron sulfur center. So now we can actually go and put a porphyrin molecule on this system. And porphyrins were kind of what we default to when, when we want to take a sort of benchmark uh, molecule and, and attach it. And so we have this nice uh, imide condensation uh, uh, that we can do and generate this molecule. And indeed, uh, the, the free energy of charge separation is considerable. So it's way downhill in a polar solvent. And so when we do femtosecond transient absorption on this, we see initially the formation of the excited singlet state. And then as time goes on, we get this accentuated band here at 615 nanometers, which in fact is the reduced species. And once again, we can uh, see that uh, because we have a single donor or a single acceptor, we, we form the reduced species very quickly in about 20 picoseconds. But it doesn't last very long. It only lasts for about 60 picoseconds. So that's not long enough to do some real real catalysis, so to speak. But nevertheless, the, um, what we wanted to do in this case is figure out what we were dealing with at a little bit more detailed level. And so uh, we went a little bit beyond transient absorption to using transient IR. And with transient IR, these, these, these three carbonyls are, are, are unique and are, have different uh, unique frequencies. And so what we found is that we could bleach out those three carbonyls and they were replaced by three frequencies that are uh, downshifted in, in frequency, which indicates that indeed the electron is spending a lot of its time right at the di-iron center. And so those changes rise and fall with the same time constants as we got from the absorption. So indeed it looks like this complex really is doing what, what, we, what, or what we think it's doing. And what's even more important, the excited singlet state of the zinc uh, is not being affected by the distant uh, di-iron complex's own electronic states, which is, which is always good. What about hydrogen? Can we generate hydrogen from this thing? Well, actually, you can generate it stoichiometrically and with a half a turnover, which is stoichiometric. So the way this goes is that if you take this complex, shine light on it, if you, in enough acid, you actually end up protonating the complex. And then the protonated complex can actually exchange with a neutral, giving you the the uh, neutral protonated complex plus a dead end porphyrin system here that's been oxidized. Another photon comes in, you turn the crank once more, and out comes the mole of hydrogen. Now, you might ask yourself, well, why don't you just add a sacrificial donor? Well, it turns out that at the, at the um, reduction potentials that this porphyrin is, is oxidized, there aren't very many sacrificial donors that like those potentials. So, consequently, it's hard to find one that will actually do the usual decomposition type of chemistry that's characteristic of sacrificial donors. So this system turns over once, and it's just happily sitting there. The problem with porphyrins, though, as we all know, is that they don't like acid for any real length of time. And so what happens is, ultimately, the zinc falls out, and we're stuck with a free base porphyrin that now has the wrong energetics. So where do we go from here? Well, it turns out that uh, actually where we go from here is, first of all, what we're going to do is extend the lifetime. What we're going to do is we're going to do a, the, the classic photosynthetic strategy of let's try to actually use a secondary donor in order to, to uh, re-reduce the, the porphyrin. Okay, so this is not sacrificial, but it's reversible. 
So we can look at a series of porphyrin ferrocene compounds. This ferrocene can easily transfer an electron to a porphyrin cation radical, and it can do so easily uh, with a downhill delta G. We, we're going to change to a TPP type of porphyrin, that is a tetraphenyl porphyrin. It's going to change the redox characteristics a little bit, but it's not going to change the end result. And so indeed, it doesn't matter which one goes first, whether the porphyrin pulls an electron out of the ferrocene and then kicks an electron into the diiron complex or vice versa. It's downhill in either case with about the same delta G. So which way is it really going to go? And so we, we first took a look at these ferrocene porphyrins because they're a little bit controversial in the literature. In other words, there are some people who claim that these molecules can electron transfer intrinsically, and other people claim that the DD states of the iron are actually problematic, and you get energy transfer to those low-lying states from the porphyrin excited state. So which is it? Well, it turns out, first of all, let's look at the other end. Uh, this end is straightforward. In other words, basically, the porphyrin and the, the diiron complex, once again, give us our band here at 616. It comes up more slowly and goes down more slowly now, in this case, simply because delta G has now changed. It obeys the usual electron transfer theory kinds of Marcus-type considerations. But now when we look at the ferrocene cases, uh, life is a little different. In other words, in the ferrocene case, if we have one phenyl there, we find that the excited state of the porphyrin disappears in about 10 picoseconds. And we don't have the accentuation of the band at six, or 16 here, because obviously we don't have the other acceptor, but this looks like a pretty clean spectrum of zinc TPP excited state. There's not much else going on. And in fact, if we look at the fluorescence time result, fluorescence of this system, we find that the time result uh, fluorescence of Porphyrin excited state disappear or Fluorescence disappears with exactly the same time constant. So indeed, it looks as if all we're really doing here is energy transferring from porphyrin to uh, ferrocene. There's no evidence whatsoever of any indication of reduction of this porphyrin. The same thing is true for the diphenyl case, except everything slows down here. Note that it's slowed down by about a factor of 20, uh, which makes sense if it's through bond dexter type transfer. And once again, simply an excited uh, state spectrum of the, of the porphyrin. So what happens now when we look at the total system? When we look at the total system, then, uh, we may have a problem. Well, indeed, when, if we have a single phenyl that's between the ferrocene and the porphyrin, what we find is that a large fraction of the uh, excited state simply goes away very rapidly. And this is just the fact that we, we're not competing very well for the, uh, uh, between the energy transfer to the ferrocene versus the electron transfer to the diiron complex. And so, 
We end up with a small yield of diiron complex, about 15%, and that, that particular oxidized ferrocene reduced diiron complex then lasts for only nine nanoseconds. However, now when we go to the two phenyl case, we completely turn it around. In other words, the yield of the diiron reduced complex now is 71%, and you can see that because now you can actually see the spectrum of the reduced complex here. Remember the porphyrin's back in the ground state. The ferrocene has virtually no absorption at all in its cation state. And so all we see is our nice little, almost spec ECAM looking kind of spectrum from the diiron complex. So the question is, how long does this thing really last now? Well, now if we compare that, here's the original femtosecond time scale spectrum, and here's a nanosecond spectrum. We've increased the lifetime by a factor of a thousand. And so this really shows that indeed the photosynthetic design rubric can be used in this context as well. But, and the caveat is, you've got to be careful to not get involved with energy transfer processes to other metal centers that are going to complicate the issue. So this really points out that particular aspect of things. Um, okay. I mentioned before the idea that porphyrins are great if you want to understand something about mechanism, but if ultimately if you're going to use porphyrins, uh, they're problematic because the zinc is going to fall out and all the redox is going to change. And so we've shifted over to using these perylene dyes, or these perylene monoamide dyes, in, in point of fact. And I can show you at this point uh, in, the, in, the, in the process that indeed we get electron transfer from the photoexcited perylene dye to the iron complex in about three picoseconds. Now this thing lasts for about a half a nanosecond just in one shot. And so we can play the same game, ultimately, of having multi-step electron transfer here with components that are acid insensitive. And so indeed, we're, we're striving toward um, making this system catalytic. And indeed, if you take this same system and wonder where the electron went and use transient IR spectroscopy, you essentially get the same result. In other words, we find that the electron is, in fact, localized in the diiron center. So all looks well here. So the idea is that we can move forward with this in a system that really is going to not have issues with regard to, um, as many issues with regard to decomposition. Let's take a look at the other problem. Let's take a look at the cobalt. Uh, let's take a look at cobalt oxine, for instance. Why cobalt oxine? Well, cobalt is another earth abundant metal. Uh, cobalt oxine type of complex has been around for more than 50 years. They've been recently rediscovered. And it turns out that rediscovery is the fact that they actually provide a number of easy to reduce uh, proton reduction catalysts. But cobaloxine complexes have, have speak to another issue that we're interested in. In other words, the resting state, for instance, of this complex that we, sh we show up here, this is this uh, diglyoxamate that has uh, the BF2 uh, groups uh, binding the oxygens, that complex is paramagnetic. Its resting state is cobalt-2. So is that going to be a problem for us if we try to photo drive it? And indeed, uh, the mechanism of reduction of this guy is, is really requires two electrons again. You go from cobalt 2 to cobalt 1. Cobalt 1 picks up a proton. You give the cobalt 3 hydride, and then it can, re it can react further with an electron and a proton by a number of pathways depending on conditions. And these, these have been pretty much worked out uh, by other groups uh, around the world. And so we, we'd like to figure out what are the issues in trying to photodrive this system. So we, we de decided straight away to deal with a system that uh, was, was pretty vanilla. In other words, we designed this system to work purely in polar media, to so give us the most bang for our buck driving force wise, so that we just took a plain perylene donor, which absorbs at 440, 450 nanometers. It's one of those hydrocarbons that has a very high excited state energy, but in fact is easy to oxidize. We use a naphthalene monoimide because it is harder to reduce than most uh, uh, acceptors, and so it can deliver an electron into a secondary uh, site, a catalyst, for instance, with, a, with, a, with a, a, a pretty good delta G driving force behind it. So the idea here was to mate these guys with the cobaloxine complex, but the question is what to, do, what to do in between. In other words, how can we control the rate here so that we have a convenient rate to the cobalt complex? Well, we all know from, from Marcus theory that it depends on electronic coupling as well as delta G. So if delta G is the same here, it's really an electronic coupling issue. So that can we just put a phenyl there? Can we twist it with the dimethyl to 
reduce the coupling, or do we really have to really decouple these strongly in order to get really good performance? And so let's figure out what we have to do here. Well, first of all, we decided to put a phenyl in between them. We're just looking at the ligands here. And so indeed, indeed you get a rapid electron transfer. It takes about 11 picoseconds to get out, about 550 to come back. And you get all of the classical signatures of what's happening, the paralene excited state here, the paralene cation here. Naphthalene monoimide minus is, is kind of puny in this region of the spectrum. It turns out it has a pretty nice absorption around 920, 930. And so this is in the, in the near IR region. And so paralene uh, excited state also has a nice absorption out there. So this is uh, not bad, but maybe we can do better. And so if we go to the dimethylphenol, we find we can get something for nothing. In other words, if we can trade off rate on the forward reaction, it's still 99 plus percent yield. And so we can get uh, a much uh, longer uh, lifetime for the charge separation, this, this now being two nanoseconds. Spectra are say, the same. You can see now that we've twisted this phenyl, the spectra are crisper, they're sharper, they're more distinctive of the individual components. There's less electronic coupling between them. Last but not least, we can kind of go the other direction and put two phenyls, and with one being a tetramethyl phenyl, it actually really decouples things strongly. And so what we see here, wow, we've really gone over the, off the deep end on the forward rate. Now it's down to 1.2 nanoseconds. And this rate is certainly long. It's more than six nanoseconds. But unfortunately, because the excited state lifetime of the perylene is two and a half nanoseconds, we only have now a 68% yield of the initial charge separation. So we've perhaps erred too much in one direction. And so really the, the choice the choice is, is clear that it ought to be the dimethyl phenyl in this particular case to give us the maximum lifetime also uh, at a uh, with the maximum yield as well. Okay, so what happens now when we try to couple this with the cobalt? We're do, we're doing the 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 uh, the coward's way of doing this, I, as I call it. We're doing we're putting we're just ligating it to the to the purity now. If you put this in the presence of strong acid, clearly that pyridine is going to get protonated and that ligand is no longer going to be attached to cobalt. But at this point, we simply want to see whether we're going to get the electron to the cobalt. We're actually working now on a covalent version of this system, which actually does not uh, have the uh, uh, cobalt simply ligated via, via pyridine. And so it turns out, as I mentioned, the cobalt complex is very easy to reduce, minus 0.55. And so we're downhill all the way. So we should actually end up reducing the, the cobalt complex. And so when we play the same, uh, same game again, uh, we get a little something for nothing here because the pyridine ligand actually makes the, the uh, um, naphthalene monoimide a little easier to reduce. So the rate of the forward reaction is about 10 picoseconds. But interestingly, the electron then zips into the cobalt in about 6 picoseconds. And so then something interesting happens. Part of it simply returns in 620 picoseconds, but then there's a long-lived species. In other words, there's a dissociation, we believe, that occurs in about two nanoseconds, where this guy actually comes off as the reduced species and, and wanders away for a while before eventually finding its way back. And so that's this long-lived long -lived species here. So indeed, we can actually get the system to reduce the cobalt, no problem in this particular case and do so uh, competitively with energy transfer. Now, one thing I'm not going to get into detail about is what happens when we actually have the phenyl here that is where it's the, the electron transfer lifetime is shorter and the coupling is longer. Actually, what we see in that case is we actually do see energy transfer quench quenching to the cobalt, which is competitive with electron transfer. So the energy literally goes from the excited state here into the cobalt and is quenched by the cobalt to a large degree. So indeed, by controlling coupling, you can actually control the trade-off between energy transfer quenching and electron transfer as well. So here's the kind of the bottom line on this. Basically, you can see, uh, once again, in the, in the near-infrared region, this, the perylene, uh, the perylene uh, excited state go away, the peaks from NMI. But now, at long lifetimes, you can actually see the perylene plus cobalt minus guy kind of peeking out here. I mean, the, the extinction coefficient of the cobalt one is really pretty pretty small, and so it, it's really hard to see. And so right now, we're we're uh, doing in, uh, transient infrared on this to take a look to see whether we can see characteristic vibrations of the cobalt complex, which are 
characteristic uh, of its of its reduced states. Lastly, now let's let's just move the, the interaction of the electron, the relaxation of the electron on the iridium, and so we get mostly a triplet configuration. So when it back reacts, we end up with a triplet state of the PDI, and so that hangs around for a long time. So if that's the case, if we go to a more polar solvent, we ought to see the lifetime actually go up. And why is that? Well, that, that's actually happened. If we look at the benzonitrile case here. Here's the, life, here's the lifetime of the ligand again, and here's the lifetime of the, of the charge-separated iridium-4 PDI minus case, and it went, it went up to 140 picoseconds. And because this is simple Marcus electron transfer theory again. Basically, if we sent the, if we charge recombines to the ground state, we have a big energy gap, and so that's an inverted region. So if we make that gap smaller by going to a more, more polar solvent, then that rate is actually going to increase because we're climbing back toward the top of the Marcus per, uh, rate versus free energy relationship. However, if we're going to the triplet state, we're still in the normal region. So indeed, as we make the gap smaller, we're even more in the normal region. And consequently, the rate ought to slow down, which it seems to do in this case. So this is cool because it shows us that we can actually not worry about the heavy atom effect here. We can actually get to iridium-4. Now the question is, when we attach the catalyst to the PDI, do we mess up their catalytic activity? Well, it turns out that if we put them in uh, prop uh, propylene carbonate with, a, with about 6% water and look for catalytic waves, if we look at one of these catalysts, you see a nice catalytic wave here uh, for production of oxygen from water. And if you put our molecules, here's one of them, in the same medium, you find you get a nice catalytic wave here. So the mere, merely the attachment to the chromophore does not kill our catalytic activity. So where, where do we go from here? Well, we play the same game that photosynthesis does. We do multi-step electron transfer. And so our first goal here is to use an acceptor that can take an electron out of this photooxidant. And so we switch photooxidants here. We switch from a perylene diamide to a perylene monoamide. And the reason for that is somewhat of the design con uh, constraints and simplicity. Uh, but what we found is that, for instance, this amino perylene monoamide has a really, it's really hard to oxidize, about 1.5 volts versus saturated calomel, another 1.75 versus normal hydrogen. And so by photoexciting this guy in the visible, we can, we can kick an electron off to the naphthalene diamide. And we're using the naphthalene diamide as our, our surrogate place to park an electron, and we'll see why in a second. If we do transient absorption on this, we can clearly see that in less than one picosecond, the charge separation occurs in, in dichloromethane, and it hangs in there for about 80 picoseconds, which is good enough. So the next step really is to attach the, the iridium complex, and that's what we're in the process of doing right now. So why would we want to have this naphthalene diamide as our, as our, what I call our surrogate acceptor? In other words, a place to park the electron. Well, in, you might envision with the electron here, the perylene back in the ground state, and this guy is iridium-4, we could try to pull out another electron from the iridium complex and just try to dump the electron into the naphthalene diamide, but that probably wouldn't be so good because it's now much harder to reduce the monoreduced naphthalene diamide to a dianide. But of course, there's a system where you can dump an infinite number of electrons, and so that's TiO2. And so using some strategies that, was, that were developed by uh, Brudvig, uh, we can use an ACAC group to bind the system to TiO2. The idea is naphthalene diamide and TiO2 have within 100 millivolts of each other having the same redox chemistry. So that if we get it to work with this system in the first step, then we go to this system and then we can make it work with, with a, an electrode system. But we can go further than that. Remember the proton reduction system. Now, it turns out that we can actually, you know, in a solar fuels without wire system, pr presumably reduce the iron complex directly with the first electron that occurs from this guy. And so even though ultimately you'd end up with hydrogen and oxygen mixed in the same vessel here, which may sound like a disaster, it turns out that there are the people who are in the air products handling business, the big, the big corporations that do this, are not as concerned about this as, as we are as, as on the scientific end. And so uh, it may be possible to make a gas separation at some level, even in a homogeneous system that both the water oxidation and the proton reduction system are coupled together. 
So this is where we're going with this, and this is uh, in the next few months what we're going to be developing. So let me just summarize where, I've, where we've been and uh, what I've told you. And that is, we have uh, modified this diphthylate complex so that it actually behaves itself with redox chemistry that is comparable to the cofactor that one finds in nature. Uh, we can photo drive it. I mean, it's not catalytic, but and it will turn over, uh, single turnover to produce hydrogen. You can extend this lifetime using the classical multi-step electron transfer approach of photosynthesis, and this does work. And, but you have to be careful to avoid the issues with energy transfer to low-lying state, uh, states of the metals. Uh, the high potential uh, photogenerated reductants that we have been exploring with the cobalt complex show us that we can actually feed out energy transfer and paramagnetic state quenching in these systems as well with the proper design. And last but not least, uh, we can generate very powerful uh, organic photooxidants, which themselves are not chewed up in the process of the chemistry in order to generate the high valent iridium states that are necessary to drive this particularly facile iridium-based catalyst for water oxidation. So with that, let me just thank some people. Let me thank uh, the group members here that you saw featured on the slides, uh, Prima, Brad, uh, Amanda Smay, Dick, Amanda Samuel, and Mike Manini were principally involved with this. Um, I mentioned the, my, my close collaborators on this in the center, Gary Bradley, Brock Crabtree, and uh, this was largely paid for by the, by the center in the FRC with a, with a, a little peripheral stuff from uh, the normal programs in DOE. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to answer some questions. Right. It, it, it turns out it's the other part that's poison. Not the, these guys are not that oxygen sensitive. Okay. So the question is for the uh, for the uh, video audience. The question is how long do these particular perylene dyes last? Uh, under these circumstances, the, the honest answer is I don't know, but I do know that. BASF has developed these dyes as paint pigments, and they have they put them on panels out in the sunshine and let them sit there for five years. And so, if they don't fade, then they can use them for the pigment in a Ferrari. And so, you don't have your hundred some thousand dollar car turning pink in the sunshine. So, they're willing to go that far with them. So, I suspect that um, under these circumstances, we should be able to find ways to keep them stable for a long time. In our own context, our own experience. We shoot these with high energy femtosecond laser pulses, you know, one, two thousand times a second over hours, and they don't seem to mind. Uh, basically, that's based on a, a, a catalyst that Gary has developed, which, uh, which he calls the blue layer. Basically, you can actually plate this catalyst out. It's not iridium oxide. It's an iridium, it's an iridium uh, species that involves um, essentially a kind of, um, um, for lack of a better word, a, it has a carbonyl. It has a carbonyl involved in there as well. As a, as a bond, is a an, actually a carbonyl and almost a, car, and a carboxylate. It's almost a malonate kind of system that's incorporated in the catalyst. And we actually have, through work that Lin Chen has done, we actually have, uh, and Dave Tidi, we have good XFs data that shows what the nature of this catalyst is. And it, it's not iridium oxide. And that blue layer catalyst is what can be produced in at 42 cents a square foot. And it's really, it's as active for oxygen evolution as is the homogeneous catalyst. We have a remote question which uh, comes from John Lindsay. Hi, John. <laughs> he says, uh, congratulations for a beautiful set of new molecules. I wonder what your thoughts are on moving to the red of near IR for solar moving things. I think this is an important problem being in the red NIR, but a pure chlorophyll, for example, black high oxidation. Right. 
Well, I, I think I think uh, for for that very reason, oxidative for, for oxidative processes, I think I think uh, we're stuck in the mid visible at least because uh, if you look at the systems we've looked at with 